Okay, we're okay, ready. We're ready. Okay, All I'm right. ready. This is, an in, this is an interview at the Beltran Living Center, Colony, New York, the 27th of August, 2003, uh, 2.45 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth? Mark Kishton. Uh, born in Youngstown, Ohio. And when? Uh, September 7th. Of course, uh, my record shows September 10th. I really was born in September 7th. Okay. But I, I go by September 10th. My social security and everything goes by the 10th. Okay. So I'll say September 10th, 1916. Okay. Um, what was your educational background before you went into service? I went to a school in, in Youngstown, Ohio, Young, uh, Cle uh, Cheney High School, and uh, during the Depression, you see, mm -hmm. I kept going to school, but uh, I, I had staggered grades. Some of my grades were 11th grade, mm -hmm. but then I quit to go to work to make money to eat, because mm -hmm. uh, depression was depression, and everybody was striving to live. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and um, what you remember your reaction to Pearl Harbor? Oh, Pearl Harbor, uh, I didn't pay much attention to military going gone. Mm -hmm. Not in those days, I was younger, you know, and I didn't pay too much attention to it. Because I paid it more attention to my life and my livelihood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you draft, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. Okay. Um, where did you, where were you inducted? I was inducted in uh, Fort Hayes, Columbus, Ohio. Okay. And where did you go for basic? Was that your... Fort McClellan, Alabama. And they nicknamed it the Alcatraz of the South. <laughs> Why was that? Well, things were pretty rough there. Mm -hmm. The drill sergeants were rough. Now, did you have mostly southern drill sergeants? I think so. Mm -hmm. How did you get along? In particular. How did you get along with them, being a northerner? I, I had no problem. I had no problem. Okay. Um, so that's where you stayed for all of your basic training? It was in Fort McClellan, Alabama. All right. And you went into service when? Uh, date, you know, I'm not okay. too hazy for me. Okay. But it was in 40, I think it was 41 or 42. Okay. Um, did you receive any specialized training at all? None at all. Mm -hmm. But I spoke different languages, you see, and I thought perhaps I would get into intelligence. You see. Uh -huh. What language did you, languages did you speak? Ukrainian, Russian, Polish. Oh. Not fluent. I speak Ukrainian fluently, mm -hmm. and the others I can get along with. It. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you didn't go into intelligence then? No, no, they discouraged me. <laughs> okay. Um, when did you go overseas? Uh, well, I took my basic training 17 weeks, mm -hmm. and I came home for 10, 10 days, and they shipped me to, I went to Fort uh, Camp Patrick Henry, the swamp. I, we stayed there for a, a week or two, and until the ship came. Mm -hmm. And from there we went right overseas. Were you assigned to the uh, third infantry right away or were you well, replacement? I, no, I went to uh, Iran from for me from uh, from Patrick Henry we went to Iran Africa and we stayed on on the uh, on the dock for about 4 days waiting for ship to come. Mhm. Mm now you went over, did you go over in a convoy or a single ship? No, single ship. Okay. U.S.S. Just America. And as a matter of fact, somebody, the word got around that there was a submarine following us. And uh, the ship was going zigzag. Mm -hmm. It took us 10 days to get to Iran, Africa. Mm -hmm. What did you uh, do? You just stayed on the ship while you were there? Yeah, I stayed on the ship. And then where did you go? From there we got on, uh, we got on, we went to Iran, disbarked. 
we sit on the dock for about four days, waiting for another ship to come to pick us up. Mm -hmm. When the ship did come, we got on a ship and we went, we went past Sicily and right to Naples, Italy. But we couldn't get to the, to the dock in Naples because there's too many, the Americans bombed ships, you know, and the ships were laying on their side, mm -hmm. and we couldn't get to the, to the harbor, to the dock. So they put planks, planks from one, one hull to another, and we had to crawl, the, walk on those planks to get to the uh, harbor. Mm -hmm. Then they, we stayed there for a while, and then we, uh, I got on the LST, and, uh, And they had ducks on the LST, and we were loaded onto the ducks, mm -hmm. and we went straight to Anzio. All right, so you landed, were you in the first wave? No, I was in the second wave. Second wave? On, on Anzio, mm -hmm. in Anzio. Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us about your, that was your first combat? Well, that's when I started hearing the guns. Mm -hmm. We got, uh, of course, we got to Anzio, to the harbor, and... Uh, we were loaded on the ducks, and now the the, uh, the LSC opened its big doors, mm -hmm. and the ducks came out. And I'm not what what happened after that is very hazy. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sure. Well, we got on the ducks of that. I'm sure, and we got uh, we got to the uh, the ducks got onto the beach. You see, because all of us jumped off. Mm -hmm. We had those their cargo nets. And we climbed down. And as I came down, I was probably in the last, the last of the boys that were going in. And as I was, as I was going, uh, there was a dogfight, airplane dogfighting. And one came right at me. I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> and he, it's a Messerschmitt, you see. Mm -hmm. And he had both of his guns on both sides. And it's true. he was the the machines were, were working, you see. And I'm walking here, and I see that son of a gun. I said, "What the hell did you shoot at me for? <laughs> a single man? That's mm -hmm. crazy! You don't sing a, shoot a single man, waste all that ammunition yeah. on a single person. If there was a group of people, yes, yeah, different story, but not on a single person. But he said, and I start running. There's a wall there, so I start running toward the wall, and. Uh, it's lucky thing I didn't jump into that wall, because the guys, when they had, they had to go, you see, uh -huh. that's where they went. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I backed off there, and I went and I joined the group. This was later in the well, in a day, still daylight, and I got up to the group, and whoever was going to take us to our uh, specific companies, you know, no, we can't take it now, because it's too dead, too, too bright. And the Germans are in the hills, you see the mountains there, and they got those binoculars, Zeiss and Leica binoculars, they can see it fly. Mm -hmm. And they weren't too far away. We, we penetrated about five miles. So we were here, but they could see us anywhere, every, anywhere we went. So they said, well, we won't take you to the front now because it's too daylight. We'll take you, we'll put you in a spot, and we'll keep it in storage for a couple hours. And in, in the evening or in the morning, we'll take you to the front. Mm -hmm. We'll take you to your respective uh, company. So they loaded us up on, on trucks, and they took us, they took us toward the swamps. Mm -hmm. Were you under fire at all during no. this whole time, or? Well, yes, you see, those airplanes were the airplanes. dog fighting. Mm -hmm. Did you have any 88s firing at you oh, while you yes, were coming yes, in? Yes, 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 88, but the, the worst thing was the Messerschmitt with the machine guns. <clears throat> they put us on these trucks and they took us, and we went past the house that Nero, Nero lived in. Nero played the violin yes, yeah. while the room was burning. Uh -huh. uh, we went past there and we went to the swamps. Now, it was evening already, you know. So we got to the swamps and said, and Sergeant said, well, okay, you guys, find a spot where you can bed down, and we'll call you when, when we're ready to go. This is the swamp. So where are you going to find a spot to sleep in in the swamp? Mm -hmm. 
But anyhow, I found a little clump, and I laid down there, and uh, I laid there for about 15 to 20 minutes, and the sergeant said, okay, guys, rack it up. So rack it up means get all your stuff and get ready to go. So we racked it up and started walking and put it back on the trucks, took it back to where we came from. And there they, they uh, told us where we were going to the, re uh, to the company or the company that you're going to go to, the respective company that you're going to join. Mm -hmm. So I was assigned to Company G. But we didn't go right away. We waited until nightfall, or, well, evening. Mm -hmm. And then we started walking to our company. And I walked, my company and the, the first sergeant was there, you know. So he, he, uh, he uh, what the hell, what should I say? He, he had told us you know, what the platoon we were going to and all that. Stuff. I was assigned to the third platoon. But I didn't stay there very long. Because they needed. There's a glass of water there also if you like one. That's what I think I need. I was assigned to the third platoon. Mm -hmm. But I didn't stay there very long. Because they needed some. They needed a couple of guys in the company headquarters. So they jerked, and I was an older person, you see. I'll tell you about that later. There was a colonel that told me, when I, in one of, one of my uh, Purple Hearts, you see, the colonel asked me, how old are you? I said, I'm 27. He said, what are you doing in the infantry? I said, I don't know, but they put me here and I'm, I'm doing what I have to do. He said, you don't belong here. I said, tell them that. <laughs> I said, well, where should I go? He said, well, you could have gone to the artillery or something like that where, you know, you know, older people go. Not, but not in the infantry, not on the front line. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm here and I'm doing what so I have you to must, do. You must have been one of the oldest guys in the unit then. Well, the, uh, some of the officers were. No, by outside of the officers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was on the older, older. Mm -hmm. Edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was 27. But where was I at? Now? You were talking being assigned to the headquarters company. Yeah, the headquarters company. And we were, I went to the headquarters company, and the first sergeant came out and said, Okay, you guys dig here. Dig yourself a fox over. So I'm, and I saw a fox over there, you know, that was, that was dug. Partially dug, you know. So I said, "Well, I'll take that." It's partially dug, and so it's helping me, helping me out. So I start digging there. By the way, I was one of the champion fossil diggers. <laughs> I had a, a, a one of those shovels, collapsible shovels. Mm -hmm. I had a pigmatic, and I had an axe that I could shave with. And so I'm digging a fossil there, you know. And uh, I saw a big cartwheel, one of those big ox cartwheels. It was not too far away from me. So I dug myself a hole, and I'm digging, and now it started to rain, and very, very cold, cold rain. And I'm thinking, hey, hurry up, and hide yourself, get yourself covered over. And I started smoking then, too, because there were shells falling, you know. And I got nervous, and I started a new, new habit, I started mm -hmm. smoking. I said, well, let, let's get going, and you'll smoke, and you'll be covered, you'll, you'll, you'll cover yourself in the rain, we won't be on you. So I got, and then I, when I dug down about two foot, just enough to get below the level of ground, then I got that cartwheel and I put it all over. Mm -hmm. Then I put the, my, a shelter half, I put it on top of that. Then I put all the dirt on top of that. Mm -hmm. Then I was crawling around and I got all the grass, you see, the camouflage. I put the grass on it and, and it, there were no trees there because it was all flat. Mm -hmm. But whatever was there, I green stuff, you see. Mm -hmm. I put it on there to camouflage it. Then I got in and I started smoking. 
How long were you in, in Anzio? I was there for about four, about four months. Mm -hmm. From beginning to end. I came on Anzio right after they made the invasion. I was the, the, the back end of, of the invading group. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say that I was too far back, you know. I, I was there with them, but in the rear part of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the actual... Oh, when when I was coming and when I got off the L, LST and I saw those airplanes shooting and as an afterthought, I knew why they were shooting. Uh, they had the ammunition dumps there, you see. Mm -hmm. But some idiot put a hospital right outside the ammunition dump. Mm -hmm. well, what they were doing, they were shooting for the ammunition dumps, but they were hitting the hospital too. So there, are, there were female nurses that had purple hearts too because of that. Mm -hmm. Then later on, they dug, dug down deeper for the hospital to get the patient below ground level. Mm -hmm. But that did do, didn't do much because. They could shoot at us any time they wanted to. And they could hit us too. So then I got to my foxhole, you see. And uh, I dug the foxhole out real light. And the first sergeant came back again and said, Come here, you guys. You, 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 you. Four of us. And he put us in front of the CP to guard the CP. Mm -hmm. He was thinking of himself. Mm -hmm. So we got, and uh, this was even before the, the night was over. Come on, and he put us out there. He said, Start digging here. So I started digging. And uh, the sergeant, first sergeant said, uh, Were any of you guys uh, water, salt water corporals or salt water sergeants? And nobody answered, nobody volunteered, no. No, everybody kept quiet. You learn that in basic training, you see. Never volunteer for nothing. So nobody said nothing. Mm -hmm. So he came and he said, you're a sergeant. I said, I don't want to be a sergeant. He said, well, you're a sergeant. So I said, and he walked away. I said, so, so be it. So, uh, but I kept digging because I wanted to smoke again, you see. And I didn't dig a, a long slit trench. I dug a round hole because it would be a smaller target, you see. I dug right straight down. It was about 18 inches in diameter, you know, and I dug one. It took me about two hours to dig it, but I dug it. Once I dug it, I covered myself with my, uh, uh, with my raincoat, and I was smoking cigarettes. <coughs> then, uh, about an hour or two later, the sergeant said, well, okay, you guys, come on out and go back to the old hole. <laughs> so I went back to my old hole, but I kept digging here. Mm -hmm. I dug it deeper. Now the rain, the rain was very cold. It didn't snow there, but it, the rain was very cold. Mm -hmm. And when I came, when I left the United the States, they issued us summer clothes. Summer uniforms. Uh, we're here and the rain is cold and it, everything's cold and we got summer clothes. And so it froze. Then uh, I figured myself, no, this is no good. Anyhow, they put us, he put us back in the old holes and I'm digging, 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 you know. And now, as, as we were coming to the front, <clears throat> to our company area, you see, we all had, we were all issued gas masks and, uh, and another thing, they, they, we had uh, those uh, canvas spats, mm -hmm. that's the first thing they went. <laughs> you could tell which way we were, you see spats and, and gas masks discarded, you know. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to use them there. They're not going to use gas. So they threw the gas mask too heavy. 
But I use my container for future use. The container that the gas mask came in, I kept that because there was a uh, water couldn't get in, you know. So I kept that all the time. And uh, so I made my hole deeper and deeper and better. But now the the water's getting in there and it's getting muddy, and and water's coming through. So I got out, I passed it up real good so there wouldn't be no water leaking. Because I had. So I had to stay in there, mm -hmm. I, and I dug myself a seat. I sat down and I smoked. But you can't, you can't sleep on the front line. Now we're all over your shells exploding, or machine guns. When you sit, and I was sitting in a, in a, in the foxhole, and I hear those the, thing, the bullets. They're like the, uh, like the air, an airplane, and sonic sound. Sound, when it hits a sonic barrier, mm -hmm. a bullet does the same thing, and it sounds like popcorn. Pop, pop, pop. Every time I heard one of those, I went down deeper. Okay, so um, after Anzio, where did you go? Well, then we had the, there was a breakout to Rome. Mm -hmm. We got to Rome, we, and we stayed in. I, my company stayed in the, the uh, Carabinieri barracks. That's like uh, the American FBI. Mm -hmm. They call them Carabineros. We stayed there for three weeks, two or three weeks, and they they sent us down for. The guys thought they're gonna they're gonna stay in Rome and uh, garrison Rome, but it wasn't so. We stayed there for three weeks, and they said, "Okay, you guys, rack it up." And uh, they took us to a little village south of uh, Rome and west of uh, Naples for uh, amphibious training. So we had amphibious training there. The name of the village was Padoli. And we had basic, uh, well, amphibious training, getting ready for southern France. So we, they, we stayed there for about uh, two or three weeks. And there was one thing that happened in Pozzoli. Our captain went back. He was from Tennessee. He graduated uh, University of Tennessee. And he was a young, young fella. He was only 25 years old. I could have been his father. <laughs> but he was very smart, very good. They call him cross-country cross ward law. Because he never took, he never stayed on the roads. But that's where they, they have the road zeroed in, you see. Mm -hmm. they, we always went cross country. And uh, we went to Pozzoli for, for amphibious training. And uh, uh, one night, one day, I, I started to say, pitch your tent in a little pup tent, you see. Pitch a tent anyway, so I pushed my tent right here. To, and some idiot came around and pitched a big tent there for officer, officer's mess. So one night, one day, the sergeant came to me and said, Did you ever do wait, waiter's work? I said, Yeah, I was a maitre d'. <laughs> and he said, Well, how would you like to do this? We're going to have a, a, a going away. Uh, for the captains, because he's going back for R and R to the states. I said, "Yeah, I can do it." I said, "But you got to do everything my way. I'm the boss." Mm -hmm. He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you tell the cooks whatever you want. They have to listen to you." I said, "That's a good deal." So I set up the tent. And I set up the tables. I set up the the hard the uh, dishes and and knives and forks. And everything. everything was perfect. So now I said, when is the dinner? He said, well, tonight. I said, good, let's get started. So I told the cooks exactly what I wanted. He said, yeah, yeah, do it. I never did it before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I had an idea mm -hmm. what it was all about, because I used to play. I used to play in an orchestra. And I was around banquet halls and mm -hmm. nightclubs and stuff like that. So I knew how to, how to do it. 
and I knew what her major deed did. So I, I had an idea, so I did it. So I told the cook, now, all you guys stay out of the tent, don't come into the tent until I call you. And uh, we got to set the ditches up and the forest and the and all the stuff. Yeah, okay. And when I call you, you guys come and you get the food and bring it in. I, but before that, I'll get all the officers and seat them down according to a rank, is it? or uh, how, how long have you been, or what the first, first lieutenant or second lieutenant, you know, mm -hmm. they take preference. Or, and the executive officer, see. The captain sits here at the head of the table. Uh, the executive officer sits over there. This guy sits over here. Your first lieutenant, you sit here. I told everybody where they're supposed to sit. I said, now, you come in, you sit down. And when the when we're going to bring the captain in, I said, I'll holler, attention. And everybody stands up because that's the... Uh, that's the way they do it in, mm -hmm. the, in the military, you know, when the ranking officer comes in, right. everybody stands at attention. So that's what they did. So all these officers were sitting around, you know, and I see bottles, bottles of whiskey. <laughs> the best uh, uh, Canadian club in uh, Hennessy's, uh, what the heck, the Henn Hennessy, uh, it's not a whiskey. Scotch. Scotch. Mm -hmm. Hennessy Scotch on the table. Every uh, and, uh, and uh, four roses, whiskey. The best is on the table. See, and I got it. I got glasses by every one of them. You know, because we're gonna have a toast. You see, mm -hmm. so everything's all set. You know, and the dinner's ready. But I said, don't come in until I call you. I said, okay, everything was all set up. Now the captain came, you know, and I told the captain, I said, you follow me into the, into the dining room. So I came through the door first, and, and I heard attention. All the officers stood up, you know, and of course I said, uh, I pre I'm presenting the Huey U.E. Wardlaw, presenting Huey uh, Wardlaw, I made the announcement, mm -hmm. see. Everybody stood up, and the captain came, and uh, he, he followed me, and I pulled a chair out for him. He sat down, and then all the other officers sat down, too. And now we got to have a toast. Now, the executive officer, I told him to make the toast, because I, I poured the whiskey for him, and whatever they wanted, Hennessy or the scotch or, or the whiskey or whatever. Mm -hmm. And... And they made the toast. He, he he made a little speech and made a toast. Then they, the captain sat down first, and then all everybody else sat down. Then they start pouring the whiskey. Now, I, then I told uh, the cook, I said, now we're going to start eating. I said, now bring your plates in, and the captain gets his plate first, the executive officer next, and then everybody else, according to rank. And uh, the sergeant was there, you know, and he was smiling like crazy. <laughs> you're doing a good job. He was telling me you're doing a good job. I said, well, I'm a more than Mater D, you know. <laughs> so then after, uh, they, were, well, they were bullshitting there and talking, you know. They stayed there for a couple hours, and the booze was going down. And I had to start and I said, hey, what am I going to do with the rest of that booze? He said, do whatever you want. I said, it's a good deal. <laughs> he said, I don't know, do whatever you want. So when the, the, the party was all over, I got, I got the, bottle, the empty bottles there. They weren't empty, but they were way down. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, I, and they put their tent right next to mine. So I said, that's all right. I got the bottles and I put them, I put them right under the tent, you know, I put them to, to my tent. So when this was all over, I did, I, half the bottles were in my tent. So I said, well, 
I, the sergeant said, do what you want. So I took that for granted, and I grabbed the, the booze, and I poured, poured all I mixed them all up, put it in one bottle, and all the, the other guys were drinking it too. Not only the officers, but the GIs. Mm -hmm. So everybody was getting a little nipsy. So then the first sergeant came in and patted me on the back. He said, yeah, it's a good, you did a good job. I said, well, I was Mater D, you know. Were you uh, in the invasion in southern France? I was in the invasion in southern mm -hmm. France. That's a different story now. Okay. We, uh, we got on our uh, LCI, Landing Craft Infantry, mm -hmm. and we got on there and uh, we jumped the gun. I, I think we jumped the gun as we left port a little too early. Now, what happened with the uh, invasion was Everybody was supposed to have a rendezvous. They're supposed to be off offshore, maybe about I'm not I don't know how many miles away from shore they were supposed to be, but they were supposed to be offshore and uh, just for round figures I would say maybe about ten miles offshore, you see. Mm hmm And uh, we waited and waited because our boat was a little early. So and we were we were close to the island of Corsica. So they stopped, they dropped anchor in there, and a bunch of us got into a, a, a little dinghy boat or whatever you call them. And we went to, uh, to the beach in Corsica. We stayed there for about, about an hour and we came back. Got back, got back on a ship, and we stayed there for I don't know exactly how long. But then, and I was, and that LCI I was in the middle hole. Mm -hmm. I was in the, in the middle of the ship. And the first sergeant was up there. There was a, a stairway, a stairway going up, steps going up. And the first sergeant was at the top of the steps. I was down below. And uh, we stayed there for a couple of hours, you know, waiting, waiting for somebody to blow the whistle. Then I heard the the motors revved up. I said, "This is it. We're going in now. Everybody's poised to, uh, toward the toward the beach. You see, all the ships are all the ships probably collected themselves, you see, and everybody's on standby and everybody's ready to go." Uh, I heard the the diesel motors rev up. I said, yeah, this is it, we're going in now. So I'm standing there and then the ship starts going. And when the ship starts going, you know, I saw, uh, I heard all these shooting. I heard uh, these rockets. And uh, I didn't know what the heck it was. Mm -hmm. And I never saw, I didn't know what a rocket was. So I climbed up, uh, up the steps and I asked the first sergeant, I said, is that ours or theirs? He said, that's ours. I said, what are they? He said, those are, uh, well, not rockets, but... What do you, I forget what you call them. Well, they're the same as... They're like rockets. They had a yeah, lot of tubes yeah, yeah, that yeah. are fired together, yes. And it was going over like rain. Mm -hmm. I could see his blue, uh, white... Uh, Streaks of uh, mm -hmm. like uh, like f it was like foggy, you know, <clears throat> and it was like rain. There was so much of it. I didn't figure. No, the, those crowds don't have a chance. <laughs> There's too much of it. Mm -hmm. But then, then the ship was wrapped up, and we're going, you know, and our boat. We hit the beach, and our ship hit an octagon-shaped mine. It was, well, it was octagon-shaped mine, but these mines are all tied together, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole front end of the of the LTI it was opened up like like a orange peel. And then uh, the two sailors on either side. Are you familiar with any of that? Yes. Uh, the two sailors on the inside, they're on the gangplank, you see. Mm -hmm. that, 
when you hit the beach, and those two game plants come out, mm -hmm. and the sailor's there, and he's got a bucket of sand or cement, and he's got the rope. So he, he, he jumps off. When the boat stops, he jumps off of the game planks, and he runs out with the bucket of sand, you see. He runs, he goes to the shore. Mm -hmm. And uh, then now all the GIs, when they jump into the water, they grab, they're supposed to grab a hold of that rope and pull themselves to, to the shore. Well, I looked up and I was up there by the first sergeant already. I said, are we ready to go? He said, yeah, he said, we're ready to go. So I started following him and he jumped into the water. I jumped in after him. And he said, I can't swim. I said, neither could I. So we were both in the same boat. I said, I can't swim either. He said, I lost my helmet. I said, don't worry about the helmet. I said, there'll be a lot of helmets on the beach. You grab any of those helmets and put on your head and keep going. So he got to the beach. I said, grab a hold of the rope and pull yourself to the beach. So he grabbed the hold. I pushed him and he grabbed a hold of the rope and uh, he got himself to the beach and so did I. Uh -huh. And of course the others were following us, you see. I was always in back of him. We got to the beach, and now everybody, get off the beach. Don't stay on the beach. Get off the beach. Because they got the beach zeroed in. You got to get off the beach. So everybody's crawling to get off the beach. And I happened to be a rifle grenadier at the time. Sergeant said, you're a rifle grenadier today. I said, okay, what does a rifle grenadier do? He said, well, you'll find out when you get there. So I, I got the rifle grenade, but I got the grenades, and the grenades are heavy. Mm -hmm. So I had a pack of grenades, four grenades, and I had them tied onto, onto the belt. So we got to the beach, and uh, somebody said, uh, Rifle grenadier up front, rifle grenadier up front. I said, That's me. So I said, Okay. So I went up, because I grow, crawled up, everybody's crawling. I crawled up the beach. I said, what do you want? He said, you see that swamp over there? I said, yeah, what about it? He said, well, give a, shoot around in that swamp. And how in the hell am I going to do that? Just shoot, that's all. So I got, I got, and it's a special. You don't use the M1 with the rifle grenade. You use the old uh, O3 and O6 mm -hmm. World War I gun. Mm -hmm. And you use a blank cartridge, you see. You don't there's no uh, uh, steel jacket. It's a it's blank. Mm -hmm. So I got that and I put it's in in my in the gun already, you know. And uh, he said, "Well, shoot around into that swamp." So I got it and I fixed it up. You know, I put the grenade on. And another thing about the grenade and the gun is that the M1 rifle it has a. Uh, a sight on the tip of the of the barrel, you see, so you can't put a grenade on it. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a O3 or an O6 rifle, gr a rifle, so it will accept the grenade. So I had that rifle, you know, and I put the grenade on and I shot. And there were 17, uh, 17, uh, Prisoners came out of the swamp, so they brought them, and they're marching them down toward the rear. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm walking alongside them, and one of them swore, swore at me in Ukrainian. I said, what did you say? He said, I didn't say nothing. I said, I understand what you said because I'm, I'm Ukrainian and I understand you. And you better keep your damn mouth shut. But somebody will, will put a bullet right in your head, make you kneel down and, and you're dead. I said, don't act so damn smart. I said, now you're going to the, to, to the American side and they'll treat you right if you keep your mouth shut and you do what you have to do. I said, otherwise you're dead. No, I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. I understand what you said. Yadro is a meal. That means I understand. So... And I gave him a, a hit with the butt of the rifle. I hit his shins. 
I said, now keep quiet. He said, no, I didn't say nothing. I said, you better not say nothing. I said, then wait. And then the sergeant gets a hold of me again. He gives me all shit detail. I said, yeah. he said, come here. He said, uh, you got to go, uh, you got to go down this highway. I said, for what? He said, what? You gotta go down that highway and contact the 45th Infantry Division. They're on on the right of us. They landed too, but on the right. I said, okay, but me alone. He said, yeah, I have confidence in you. You can go alone. I said, how about give me another guy, me and another fellow going down there? No, 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 you go, go. I said, okay. So I went. I have a, now I have a, a submachine gun, a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, a, a, what they, a carbine, an officer's carbine. Mm -hmm. So I went down the highway. I'm going all alone. So I'm walking, walking, well, I must have walked a mile. Then I see a, a gang of people coming up the, up the road. So I'm going, what in the hell is that? So I walked, and the closer they came, it was, it was F, 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 free, free freedom, French freedom fighters. Uh -huh. They're walking down, and there's one man in front of them. So I'm walking too, and I got my machine gun. So I'm walking too, and they're coming. And the closer they come, the more I, I recognize the the man in front. It was a priest. <laughs> He's got a collar and everything, and he came. And he said, Vous êtes American? I said, Oui, je suis American. Ici, drapeau. I said, I talked to him in French. I said, Here's the American flag. I said, I'm an American. He said, Well, we'll be looking for you. I said, Well, I'm looking for you too. I said, Now, I'm, I'm looking for the American 45th Division on the right. Door. He said, We didn't see nothing. Then he came close to me and he had, a, he had his hand open. And he had a, a small gun. He had a small Spanish twenty-five pistol. And he's giving it to me. I said, what, why are you giving it to me? I said, you see I have a metrayos? I have a machine gun. Metrayos. I have a machine gun and I have a, I have a, a carabine. I said, I don't need that. You keep it. He said, no, I'm a cleric. He said, I'm a priest. I, I don't... I don't Handle that stuff. I said, I don't need it either. It's too much, too heavy for me. But he gave me the pistol. I, it was very nice, right in my hand. And I put it in my pocket, and the whole gang came up, and they're drinking eau de vie. Eau de vie is alcohol, uh, well, vodka, mm -hmm. applejack. Everybody drinks, they have a big, I said, hey, come on, leave, beverly, beverly. I said, Papa, moi. I said, not for me, because I am a soldier and I don't drink. He said, come on, drink. So everybody's drinking. I said, no, 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 I got to go. So I, I asked the cleric, I said, did you see any American soldiers over here? He said, no, they didn't. They must have landed somewhere else. I told him, I explained to him in French. I said, well, I'm looking for the 45th Infantry Division. He said, no, he, he didn't see them. So then I said, well, okay, if you didn't see them, then I'm going back. So I went back to uh, to where I came from, and I'm looking for my company. There's nobody there. And so I, then there was one GI there, and I said, where did the G company go to? Oh, they got on trucks and they went. I said, now I'm all alone here. What the hell am I going to do? So, which way did they go? Oh, they went up this road. I said, okay, I'll follow them. They got on trucks and went. I said, now it's going to be tough for me to catch up to them. They got on trucks, you know. They're, they're going fast. They're not, they're not, the. Uh, they're not mucking around with no stragglers or nothing. They're they're not m marching. They're motoring. So I go well. It'll it'll take me a long time before I can get, catch up to them. 
because I don't have no translation. So I have chiseling rides there. Their, their uh, trucks, they were hauling the ammunition from the boats mm -hmm. to the tanks and stuff like that. So I got one of them and I chiseled ride with one of them and I finally caught up to them three days later and they had gone a hundred miles already. So I finally caught up the G Company and I came and I I saw the, the first sergeant. He said, where were you at? I said, where did you leave me? I said, I was exactly where you left me. So then he threw that magic word at me. You want to get court-martialed? I said, yeah, send me, court martial me and send me back to the States. I'll get out of this mess. I said, you send me, you send me all alone here, way down, down this road. I said, then you take off. I said, what am I supposed to do? I said, you, you, leave, you leave me uh, all, uh, all alone and... Uh, It's well get back get back where you to the company headquarters and keep quiet and that's it. Then we got to a, a village by the name uh, well a town by the name of X. A I X. And uh, there was a big fight there. There was one there was a sergeant that was liked by everybody in the company. His name was Emilio. He was killed. It was raining there. This was in France already. He was rain, it was raining there and uh, he was killed right on the road. So uh, the sergeant, and he was laying in, in the road. And the sergeant came and he said, hey, hey Kirsten, you want to do something? I said, no. He said, come on. He said, Emilio was laying in, in the road. And somebody's got to pick him up and put him on a jeep so they can take him away. I said, well, you got the GRO, Graves Registration. I said, that's their job. I said, why the hell should I do that? I said, come on, come on. I said, okay, Sergeant, I'll do it under one condition. Said, What's that? I said, get me a bottle of whiskey and some cigarettes and I'll do it. And a, a new uniform. I said, well, when I go there... I'm sure he's going to be loaded with blood. Blood is still going to be oozing out. And I'll get my uniform all, <coughs> all blooded up. I said, I want a new uniform and a bottle of whiskey. And another guy, because I can't pick this guy up. He's too heavy. I said, okay. They got the bottle of scotch, a bottle of a Canadian club. The me and the other kid, before we went to pick him up, we are drinking, you know. We got boozed up a little bit, you know. Where's the body? Well, he's laying right there in in the gutter. So we picked picked him up and uh, threw him on a, on a jeep. This guy, uh, the machine gun must have got him, you know. He was like a sieve. The blood was still leaking out. Uh, we picked him up, uh, put him on a jeep, and uh, I went back to company headquarters, and that's it. Sergeant said, you did a good job, did a good job. I said, well, I had a little help with the bottle. <laughs> so you went through uh, the French, southern France. southern France. Where did you go from there? From uh, Aix and Provence, we went. We we started up the Rhone, Rhone, Rhone Rhine Valley. And we went to a town by the name of Montelamar. But before we hit Mount Lemoore, there was a highway, such a highway, the Rhone, uh, I, don't, I don't know the name of it, you know, it's too, too long ago, that, and I don't remember all those things. But it was a stretch of road, and the uh, German 19th Army was retreating, because uh, <clears throat> they were losing ground, you know, they were retreating, and... Uh, the Air Corps saw, caught them and they bombed the head end and they bombed the back end. 
Now, on either side of the of the highway, there were ditches, you know, deep ditches. And when they bombed the front end and the back end, they couldn't. The Germans couldn't do nothing. They couldn't. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go backward either. But for 11 kilometers, there was nothing but dead horses, burned out tanks, burned out trucks, and trailer trailers. These uh, like we have in the United States, these trailers that the farmers haul hay on mm -hmm. with four wheel trailers. All of that was burned up on the highway. Dead horses for 11 kilometers. Mm. The, the Air Force bombed the front and the back end and they strafed them. And they kept strafing everything until they killed everything. And we were, while they were strafing, we were on both, the third division was on both sides of the road. And they're like uh, in, in a shooting gallery, you know, pop, and that's it. We destroyed the whole 19th Army, mm -hmm. German 19th Army. And we kept on going north. We traveled about a hundred miles in one day. So did you push them? You push them into Germany then? What that? Did you push them into Germany or? Well, they were they were retreating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and we fought the Mont Lamar and then. There, there's a, then we started heading for Nancy, France, and Strasbourg. And uh, we got to Strasbourg because there, there was a lot of space there between Mont Lamar and Strasbourg. But there was an incident at Strasbourg that I can remember very good. We got to Strasbourg and we got to, there's close to the Rhine River, you see. There was a bridge going across the Rhine River. Now the tank, the uh, 756 tank battalion was assigned to the 30th regiment, you see. And uh, I saw, the, I'm looking, I saw, the tank is standing right, there's a railroad bridge there and there was a road. Uh, there was a, a German soldier that ran off of the railroad bridge and he was running down this road. And uh, the gunner on the tank, he hollered at him to halt, 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 but he didn't halt. So this gunner got on a machine, a 50 caliber machine gun, brrrr, and he reeled him like, uh, like a sieve. Then to make matters worse, the tank driver went right over his body. So they asked the tank, the tank guy, what the hell did you shoot him for? Hartberg, they pull us back. They are going to give us a rest. <coughs> <coughs> My company went to Nancy, France. And the guy, they had they're pup tents, you know. But I got to be a, a male clerk. <coughs> I wasn't the male clerk, I was just helping the male clerk. Mm -hmm. As maybe, maybe because I was older, you see. Because so they were going to give me an easier job. <coughs> so we stayed with those people for about a week, week and a half. And <coughs> the sergeant came back again and racked it up again. What for? Well, we're going to hit the crowds. So now they're preparing for crossing the Siegfried Line. <coughs> and uh, they had training, you know, and they equipped all of the tanks with bull bulldozer blades. 
And then we went to, we were going to, toward uh, Frankfurt, Germany. <coughs> been at some other little village, villages there, and there was one, uh, one vi a village in particular, they had, uh, it was a sanitarium, where they had a sanitarium, and there was a big, big hospital there. I'm just trying to think what the name of it. We, we, we played south, softball there, you know. It was a, a good resting spot for us. So we said there, we were going toward that. There was 70,000 uh, patients in that hospital, German patients. It was a sanitarium. Uh, when we got there, they kicked all the Germans out, and they used the GI used that as as a hospital of their own. There was seventy thousand people there. Then, then they start. They went across the Rhine River, and that was that was a hellhole, and the water was high. This is early winter, you know. The water was high, and uh, they had pontoon bridges, pontoon boats. And in one boat, there was a, a priest. He was a Chinese priest, but he was a Catholic priest. He was Chinese, but he was a Catholic priest. He drowned. Then they got the tanks across, finally, and uh, they went toward the sacred line, and, they had the dragon's teeth, but with the bulldozer blades, with the bulldozer blades and uh, the tanks, they got through there in two minutes. That didn't stop them one bit. As a matter of fact, there were some civilians. Now I'm I'm be learning to speak German. I still speak German pretty good. Enough to, to talk with street people, and uh, they were the civilians were laughing. I said, "Why are you laughing? Why am I laughing?" He said, "It took us three months to build that. It took them three minutes to destroy it." <laughs> but they got finally got across the Seaford line, and then we headed for. Uh, we're going toward Nuremberg, and uh, now the captain said, uh, "Who speaks German?" I picked my head up. I couldn't speak German at all. At all. Do you know, speak? Do you speak German? I said, "Yeah." yeah. He said, "Well, go." Because we didn't have anything fresh there. We we never had any fresh vegetables and stuff. So the captain said, "Well." Why don't you go and see if you can get some fresh vegetables from the people? I said, sure. I said, but you got to give me some trading material. I'm not just going to yeah, go to those people and take, take anything away from them for nothing. I said, if you give me some trading material, I'll go. I said, okay, what do you want? I said, well, give me some cigarettes and soap and matches. Stuff that they can use, you know, every day. Because matches were hard to get and soap. It was unheard of. So he gave me that and I said, you got to give me your Jeep too because I'm not walking. He said, well, okay, here's the Jeep. I said, and the Jeep driver. I said, he's got to come with me. Okay, so we were going and I came to a... We're going on this road and I'm, I'm looking at looking to, for the farm farmhouses. And uh, I'm looking up and there's a, an old woman. She's she's crying. So I went up and I said, Why am I whining? I said, Why are you crying? She said, Why am I whining? I have my foot to get schneider. She said, I cut my foot. I said, Why room? She said, Well I was working in the garden 
I must have stepped on a piece of glass and cut my foot. I said, oh, that's not good. She said, no. I said, why, why don't you go to the doctor? I, you have a kind of transport. She said, I can't go because I don't have no way to get there. I said, if you come with, will you come with me if I take you? She said, yeah. I said, okay. So I got a whole, uh, she was an old woman and not very heavy. <clears throat> so I told the Jeep driver, I said, we're going to take this woman to the doctor. I said, and I asked her, I said, whoa, where's the doctor? She said, oh, I said, on this strata. She said, on this road. I said, okay, I'll take you to the doctor. So I picked her up and took her to the Jeep. And we took her to the, to the doctor. We went, started going down this road. I, she said, yeah, yeah, he, this way, this way. I said, okay, so I see a gang of people there in front of a house. She said, yeah, this, this is the plots. This is the place. So I got, we got there and uh, he stopped the Jeep. I picked her up and I'm carrying her to the, to the doctor's office. And uh, there's a lot of people. I said, Achtung, Achtung. I said, get out of the way because this is an emergency. Amen. Stop there. Okay. Go ahead. So you uh, had the crowd I, in front of the doctor's yeah, office, and I carried the woman into the doctor's office. She was an old lady. She reminded me of my mother. I carried her into the doctor's office, and when I came in into the uh, into the uh, examination room, you know. Everybody went on the side. The doctor came over. And, What's this? I said, Ma, the foot's a schneiden. He, the doctor said, What's the matter? I said, She she, she cut her foot, and, and she had she had rags all around her leg, but it's all swamped with blood. <clears throat> they got her right away. Put her on the examination table and took care of her very quick. The doctor pushed everybody aside. <laughs> this comes first. I noticed that you've got a couple of purple hearts. Were you wounded prior to to this part of the... I didn't, didn't hear him. He noticed that you had a couple of purple hearts. You hadn't I talked about seven of them. Seven purple hearts? Yeah. You were wounded seven times? No, I wasn't wounded seven times, but I was in the hospital seven times. Oh, I see. Oh. So you helped this woman out. And uh, the doctor's tending her very, very close. Then the doctor called me into, into his private office. I said, what do you do? I said, what do you want? He said, come over here and sit down. I, I sat down and he said, just a minute. He went into his private uh, uh, locker. He pulled out a bottle of... Uh, Pulled out the bottle, he, he had a couple of glasses there, and he gave me a shot of something. Looked like uh, Kalua. Mm. And I drank that, and it tasted beautiful. <laughs> I said, But how about, the, how about the Jeep driver? He said, Yeah, yeah, call him too. <laughs> the Jeep driver came in, and he gave him a couple of shots, and then the doctor said, You're a very good man. To be sign good to Latin. He said, you're a good soldier. You brought this lady in. I said, well, she reminded me of my mother. He said, that's it good. So the Jeep driver came in and we were all drinking. He said, nah, here it takes the bottle. So he gave me the whole bottle. So were you able to get vegetables for your Oh, bed? yes. Was your... Every place I went to, uh, you know, because uh, I didn't take I just didn't take the vegetables. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll 
you give me the vegetables and I'll give you matches or I'll give you cigarettes. And the cigarettes, they'll take and they'll sell them, you see. Because uh -huh. that's how they make them. Uh -huh. <clears throat> There's something that I s skipped on Anzio. Could I go back to that? Sure. Okay, retroactive. <laughs> We're going back to Anzio. I want to tell you about an incident that happened to me on Anzio. I had a bad tooth, an eye tooth was very bad. So one day, I went to the doctor, I, I went to the captain, I said, I got to go to the dentist. He said, for what? I said, well, my tooth is bothering me and it's hurting like crazy. He said, well, you don't have to go to no dentist. The dentist will come here. <laughs> Are you kidding? He said, yeah, the dentist will come right to your foxhole. He'll fix your tooth up. I said, okay, I can't do nothing about that. So I'm laying in the foxhole one day, and I hear somebody hollering, Kirsten, Kirsten, Kirsten. And I said, yeah. He said, do you have a bad tooth? I said, yep. He said, well, I'm the doctor, and I'll fix it up for you. I said, okay, let's get started. So he came right to my foxhole, and there was another kid with him was carrying something that looked like a portable sewing machine. And that was the that was the making machine to make the drill go around, see. Uh -huh. He was on that thing like a bicycle thing. So he came in and he said, What two things? I said, right here. He said, I'll take care of that right away. I said, Okay. But the shells were falling, you see. Artillery was was falling, you know and, and he said, I'll take care of that right away. So he's right, he's right by my hole. And uh, the uh, corporal set up the uh, the sewing machine, the machine the, for the drill. And uh, now the doctor said, which one is it? He, I said, well, this one right here, you see it, halfway gone. He said, okay, open your mouth. So he got that drill and started drilling me. And he's drilling and drilling and drilling, and this thing is beginning to hurt me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I said, uh, and he's a captain. I said, I said, Doctor, you're hurting me. You're not, you're torturing me. I know I got a bad tooth, but you can't you take it? Use a little TLC. I mean, uh, let loose of that thing once in a while to give me a little breathing area, room. Because you you must have hit a, a, a nerve, you know, and that hurts. Mm -hmm. That hurts worse than the little bullets. He said, well, but this is the front line. He said, I got to do it fast. This is the front line. I said, I realize that. I've been on this front line for two or three months already. I know this is the front line. But you got to take and let this thing cool off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Don't just keep drilling and with no end. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll do a little better now. But he went back in again, and the same thing, he kept drilling, 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 he had another nerve. And I was ready to jump to the ceiling. I said, doctor, take care, take it easy. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went back in, uh, I grabbed his hand and I pulled his hand away. I said, let the damn thing go, I don't care about the tooth. I said, don't, don't put that drill in my mouth again. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm damn sure. And I put my hand on, my, I had a pistol. I had put my hand on the pistol. He said, oh, when you put it that way, I said, that's exactly how I put it. I said, keep the hell away from me now. I said, because you're hurting me worse than, than the bullet. I said, don't touch me again. He said, you sure? I said, positive, get out of here. I said, get your stuff and get the hell out, get away from me, don't touch me again. Now, this is the captain that I'm talking to. I shouldn't be talking to a, an officer like that, but he hurt me. Mm -hmm. I said, you're torturing me, torturing me, you know. He said, well, it's got to be done. He said, this is, a, this is the front line. I said, get out of here. So he packed up and they both ran, ran that way. And that's it. I, now, in, in, uh, when I got to Germany, in Castle, Germany, this is well, a year or two later, and I spoke, I spoke good German then. And I asked the people, I said, is there a, 
uh, the dentist around here somewhere. He said, yeah, yeah, it one right up the street here. I said, good, I'll go and pay him a visit. So I went to this, uh, but I'm, I'm jumping the gun, I'm going too far forward. But this is what happened in Castle, Germany. <clears throat> I went to this dentist. I said, Du bist ein Zenarzt? He said, Ja, ich bin Zenarzt. I said, Are you a dentist? He said, Yeah, I'm a dentist. He said, What do you look at? He said, What do you want? I said, I said, Cook in here with my Zenar. I said, Look at my tooth. I said, It's schlecht. I said, The teeth, the tooth is no good and it's hurting me. He said, I'll repair it. He said, I'll fix it up. And he said, I said, What is it going to cost? He said, Nothing. He said, only one thing, you got to write a letter for me. I said, to who? He said, uh, you got to write a letter to my brother in Wisconsin. I said, I can't do that. He said, yeah. He, I said, well, maybe I could. I said, I'll write a letter and tell him that you're feeling fine, that the war went through here, and everything's all right. Uh -huh. So that's permissible. But I'm not allowed to disclose positions or nothing. Because what happened in Castle Germany, because uh, the Germans uh, with the V1s and V2s, they bombarded Coventry in England mm -hmm. and they destroyed the city. So in retaliation, the American, Canadian and English Air Force went over Castle for 35 minutes, and they leveled it. There wasn't a brick standing. Now, there's a lot of people that went into their uh, bomb, bomb shelters in their homes. They went into the bomb shelters because the airplanes are falling, bombing. And uh, a lot of those people got, went into the bomb shelters. They never came out because the bomb, they used blockbusters on those buildings. And, they were trapped in, in, in the bomb shelter. They couldn't get out. So uh, from what I heard, there were thirty thousand people got killed that way in Castle Germany alone. I know that's an ex exaggerated figure, but that's what I heard. Now, how many Purple Hearts did you receive? Seven. Seven. How many times? Oh, wait, wait. I got, I got, I got that. Everything in my in. Could I go in my van and get that? Um, uh, I don't think we'll have time yeah. right now. Sorry. Because book. I have. A, oh, I have a history book. I talk, talked to you about a history book, didn't I? Yes, I remember you talking yeah. to me about that. I have a history book, and I have uh, uh, decorations that were given to me in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Uh -huh. It'll take me a minute to get them. Well, why don't why don't you wait till the end of the the tape and the we'll, tape and then okay, we could okay. uh, make some copies mm -hmm. maybe. Um, how many you had, how you were wounded? Where were you wounded and when? <clears throat> this is I don't know the exact date, but there's one that I I hesitate to talk about because there's a kid that was with me. He was my buddy for the day. He was like this. He got killed and I didn't. Mm. I see you got the uh, the bronze star too. Yeah. Uh, what what did you get the bronze no, star for? Everybody in the division got a bronze star. Okay. Now you mentioned though when you're here. You had received four of them, four bronze stars, did you? Uh, I was a sergeant for eight hours. Mm -hmm. I told the shovel. Well, it says here that you received four bronze stars. Four bronze stars? Yes. Or, or uh, battle stars. Battle stars. Uh, uh, battle stars, I got... Uh, I got ten of them. Mm -hmm. Ten battle stars. Mm -hmm. I have a loose paper and I have a... And the newspaper will show you. I got a uh, written on the newspaper, but it's a. Uh, I belong to the Third Infant Disease Society. Mm -hmm. And they publish a. Uh, 
They publish uh, what you call every every month. Mm -hmm. And on that, it tells you how many battle stars I got. Mm -hmm. okay. And I got ten, ten of them. Okay. Um, so you served through until December of 45. Right. Mm -hmm. December, that's another story. December uh, 45, uh, what happened is we were in Castle, Germany, you see, and I was in, in the mail room sorting out the mail and the sergeant came by and said, hey, Kirsten, you want to go home? I asked pretty stupid. <laughs> I said, Nasty, who wouldn't want to go home? He said, well, hurry up, because there's a truck waiting for you. I said, okay. I got all my stuff and I threw it in the duffel bag. And the truck is outside waiting. And uh, I got on a truck and we went to... Uh, They're taking us to Mar Marseille, France. Because that's where the boat was going to be to take us home. I came home with the 36th, 36th Infantry Division. I came in with the, well, I don't know, I wasn't assigned to no, no outfit when I came to Iran, Africa, but coming home, I was assigned to the 36th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Did you go home with any of your friends that were? No. Uh, see, they, they take, they, I had 85, we got home by points, you see. Right. Depending on how many points you had. I had 85 points. The sergeant said, you want to go home? I said, who wouldn't? I said, I got 85 points already. I, I should have been home already. He said, well, hurry up, the truck is waiting for you. So I got on a truck. We went to an airport, and they had C-47s waiting for us. We got on C-47, and uh, this pilot wanted to make, he was going to make a shortcut, so he's going over the Alps, and this C-47 was chucking along, chucking along. It must have been one of the older ones. I swear that... When we were going over the Alps, you know, I, if I opened the door, I could hit the top of the, uh, of the mountain. The, that airplane just, just barely made it over, over the mountain. So we got, finally got to Marseille, and there's a repo depot, they call that, replacement depot. Mm -hmm. So I got into that replacement depot, and because uh, I had a souvenir gun, everybody had a souvenir. And uh, the word got around that uh, you can take the souvenir home, but you got you can't take no ammunition home, and you can't take uh, a live gun. You got to take the uh, firing pin, the pin, mm -hmm. the firing pin. You got to take that out, and then you can take it. So I I took my firing pin out, and I didn't have no. I had ammunition. Then the word got around that uh, you can't take ammunition on board the boat. You got to get rid of it. So okay, there there was the latrines there. You see, there's a lot of rats running around in the latrines. So they toppled over the latrines. The rats scattered around. The guys with their guns, you know, wait. They're they're shooting off all of the ammunition. They they're shooting at the rats. They're having a field. They're having fun shooting at the rats. Finally got rid of all the ammunition. And there's a lot of GIs that had little dogs. Not, a, not allowed to take a dog on board either. So they got these dogs and they, they got them drunk. They fed them a whiskey. They had whiskey on, on a plate, you know. The dog would lap up the whiskey and the dog would keep quiet. So a lot of these guys when they're going on board, they had, they had they covered them over with something. You know, they had the dog right here, and the dog kept quiet. He, he brought the dog from from Europe. He brought it to the United States. Okay. 
When were you discharged? I was discharged in 1945, uh -huh. uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. What happened is, that's another story. What happened is, uh, we were Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, we were being processed. Then they took us from Fort Meade, Maryland, they took us to a, a Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And uh, we stayed there for about three or four days while they were processing all of our papers. They finally got, they got through with that, and uh, one night, well, it was evening, Christmas Eve, they said, okay, you got to rack up, we're going to this railroad station. Okay. So we went to the railroad station, and I'm with the group. And now the train came, Pennsylvania Railroad, the train came and everybody got on, on the train. I was kind of the last one. So I'm waiting to get on. The conductor said, that's all, no more room, no more room. I knew what be kidding me. <laughs> I said, you know what, what day this is? I said, I called my, my people from Fort the Fort, and I told them I was going to be home today. I said, today is Christmas Eve. I said, I got to be on that train. He said, no more room. I said, yeah, there's got to be room for one. <laughs> I said, you, you get off, I get off. And then I'm, I'm handling my gun, you know. The gun was useless. It wouldn't have done nothing. But I had a knife, like a John Wayne, I had tied to my ties. And he, seen, he saw me fooling around with the gun. He said, oh, would you put it that way? He said, yeah, that's rough. So he, uh, he said, make room for this guy. So they put me on a train. I got on the train and they they lifted me up. They picked me up and put me in the bay direct. <laughs> and I stayed there until I got to uh, Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Then the conductor said, Youngstown's next stop. So I came and uh, I got off the train at Youngstown. And uh, I'm looking at the station and there's nobody there. I told them I was coming home, but there was nobody there. And then there was a black taxi driver. He said, hey, soldier, where are you going? I said, that's a hell of a question. I said, I'm going home. He said, where do you live? I said, not too far away from here. He said, you want to go home? I said, yeah. He said, come on, I'll take you. So I told him where to go. He took me home, and, the, and everybody's sleeping. I said, where in the hell are they at? And, oh, the, the black man said, yeah, there was a gang of people here, but then they were, they were waiting, 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 then they went. I, and our train had a little trouble, you see. They had some disturbance on the road or something, something happened. My people were waiting, my wife, my uh, in-laws, my mother, my father, everybody was waiting. But I wasn't coming, so they figured, well, something happened, they'll go, they went back home. So they went back home, and uh, the black man brought me to, to the house. And uh, I went and uh, I knocked on the door, and uh, my mother-in-law came. She said, oh, yeah, 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 Christmas Eve. <laughs> then my wife, we were married one year, and I went in, into the service. And my wife came down and everybody, we were celebrating all night. But this guy told me, no room. I have room for one more. As you get off, I get on, that's all. And he saw me going, touching my gun. He said, oh, would you put it that way? He said, yeah, there's room. I said, I knew there would be room. I said, get off. Can't do that, I'm the conductor. I said, well, you find room for me, or else. That's it. I got on. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much thank for your interview. Thank you. Thank you.